Welcome to Living Hope. In today's message, Pentecost in Ephesus, Dr. McLuhan teaches how the followers of Jesus in Ephesus were filled with the Holy Spirit, spoke in tongues, and prophesied. Come with me to the city of Ephesus on this Pentecost Sunday as we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit to live inside of the followers of Jesus in that town. Pentecost is an Old Testament festival that celebrated the giving of the law, the Old Testament law, on Mount Sinai. Pentecost is a Greek word simply meaning 50, because this celebration took place 50 days exactly after Passover. In the New Testament era, Pentecost celebrates the day the Holy Spirit filled the followers of Jesus with his presence in Jerusalem and the birthday of the church. 24 years after that event, approximately 54 AD, the Holy Spirit fell on the followers of Jesus in the town of Ephesus. Towards the end of his second letter to the Corinthians, Paul said, I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 8. And so Ephesus is a good place to celebrate Pentecost because it's one of the places where the Holy Spirit fell with great power. Paul first visited uh, Ephesus very briefly. He traveled to Jerusalem, went back to Antioch, and then he had to get back into it all and be back with the people in Ephesus. And so he took the inland road came through the Anatolian Plateau, down the Lycus Valley, and back into the city of Ephesus. And after returning, he was eager to meet with all the new believers that had begun to follow Jesus in that city. The first thing he wanted to know was about their experience with the Holy Spirit. He asked, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit Can you imagine Acts chapter 19 and verse 2? I've met a lot of people like that. They've not heard that they can have a relationship with God through the Holy Spirit living inside of them. Worse than that, I've met some followers of Jesus who know about the Holy Spirit but have never been personally encountered by him and act like they don't know him. They're a lot like the believers in Ephesus, <laughs> they do not know that the Holy Spirit is available for today. Now, during his visit, Paul uh, focused on being sure that the followers of Jesus in Ephesus were filled with the Holy Spirit and were flowing in signs and wonders. And Paul wrote that when Paul discovered that they did not know about the Holy Spirit, he laid his hands on them. And the Holy Spirit came down, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. Uh, If you've not had an encounter with Holy Spirit, I stretch my hands towards you right now and say, be filled with Holy Spirit and prophesy. In the room, be filled with Holy Spirit and prophesy. Wherever you're watching, whatever platform, be filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesy. Those are words that God will give you to say, and you say, I... I I can't believe I said that. That's what it means to prophesy. The Spirit comes upon you, and you say things you never thought on your own to say. Now, for the next three years, Paul trained all the followers of Jesus how to move in the supernatural. When Luke wrote about it, this is what he said. Extraordinary miracles were taking place by the hands of Paul so that handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and evil spirits came out. Acts chapter 19 and verse 12. What a remarkable place. This is why we're celebrating in Ephesus today, because such extraordinary things happened in those days, and God is still doing them. Supernatural healing and deliverance was commonplace in the city of Ephesus. Something like that happens, the message of Jesus begins to spread rapidly. And this is what Luke wrote about it. All the residents of Asia heard the word of God, both Jews and Greeks. 
Acts chapter 19, verse 10. That's a huge swath of land. That's most of southwestern Turkey, a large portion of land, hundreds of towns and cities, and some major metropolitan areas. This means that the people living in the most important cities heard the message of Jesus and had the opportunity to receive him as her savior. And this also includes uh, the seven churches of Revelation. All of those in Western Asia had an opportunity to hear the message of Jesus. When Paul wrote his letter to the Ephesians, he gave them clear teaching on the importance of being filled with Holy Spirit He wanted to be sure all the followers of Jesus are filled with the Holy Spirit and able to release God's power in people's lives. Now, Paul spoke about the negative impact alcohol has on a drunk person to explain the positive impact that the Holy Spirit wants to have on all the followers of Jesus. Instead of being controlled by that substance, Holy Spirit wants us to control us by his presence in our lives, producing in us what does not come natural. This is how Paul worded it. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, New Living Translation, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Isn't that a simple way to say it? Instead, be filled with Holy Spirit. Wonderful words. Be filled with Holy Spirit. I release to you a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit right now. Luke recorded that the immediate evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit is that the Ephesian believers spoke in tongues and that they began to prophesy. But that's not the only evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Those are important evidences. But Paul, when he taught on being filled with the Holy Spirit and how he manifests gave us some changes in our life that the Holy Spirit brings. And what are these signs of being filled with the Holy Spirit? There are four of them that he mentions in particular. The main evidence of the Holy Spirit is that our minds and our characters are transformed so that we think like Jesus. So in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul lists four specific areas that the Holy Spirit positively wants to impact on your life and mine. He said there'll be a change in our speaking, verse 19. He said there'll be a change in our singing. There'll be a change in our praying. And there'll be a change in our behavior or in our obeying. Listen to how Paul worded it. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody with your hearts to the Lord. Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God. Even the Father and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. This is the evidence of, our be- of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Our, our lifestyle has changed. So let's just look at those things a little bit in our speaking. Always giving thanks. Just having an attitude of gratitude in everything that we face and all that we are going through. And speaking can include prophesying, hearing the voice of God and saying to people, encouraging things to lift them up. Now, singing. I mean, you can say that after you became a follower of Jesus, the type of music began to shift in your life. You began to go from dark music to light music, from music that kind of weighs you down to music that lifts you up. It's the type of music that we listen to that affects and impacts our lives. I've tried to be much more careful and discerning about the music that I listen to. But not only is it music, it's singing. And we are invited in Corinthians to sing with our minds, and we're invited to sing in the Spirit. Being filled with the Holy Spirit, God just gives you a song. And if you are not a songwriter, you can still get a spiritual song because God will give you. Just start humming on a note, and you'll end up, I think it's easier to sing in tongues than it is sometimes to even speak or pray in tongues. Just start on a note and let God take you wherever he wants to take you. And so our speaking changes, our singing changes, our praying changes. We pray fervently. We pray joyfully. We pray in the spirit. We pray with our minds. All of these areas are affected by the fullness of the Holy Spirit in our life. Sometimes when I'm counseling with people before I had um, the freedom that I have in the spirit now to pray in tongues, 
It's in the process of counseling with people and agonizing over the story I've been told that I just begin to speak in the Spirit, sing in the Spirit, pray in the Spirit over what I have just listened to. And may God help you to know when you are singing and speaking in praise and when you are singing or speaking in tongues in, in burden, out of a burden, and, and that you're doing battle for God and for somebody who is in front of you. And so through these writings of the letters, we can learn about the difference between the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit. Here's some clear teaching on these two. Baptism is not commanded anywhere in the Bible, but being filled is commanded. We just got it. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so baptism is not commanded Let's look at Ephesians chapter 1. In him you also learned the word of truth, the gospel of salvation. Believed in him you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. How many knew you were baptized in the Holy Spirit when you received Jesus as your Savior? You were like the Ephesians. You didn't know. Nobody even taught you about that. So baptism is something that is done for you, uh, but being filled is something that's done in you. Uh, baptism is such a, uh, um, so many different ways to understand these concepts. We'll talk about it today. So baptism, according to the verse we just read, is at salvation. But filling is after salvation. In the book of Acts, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit in the upper room and spoke in tongues and went out on the stairs and, and they were filled with the Spirit, began to do all sorts of things. But have you noticed every couple of chapters... It says they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They weren't rebaptized, but they were refilled. In other words, in the process of living and ministering, Holy Spirit spills out of us, and we need to have more back into our lives. I ask for a special filling of the Holy Spirit today to share this message with you. So baptism is a single act, but filling is a repeated act, and that's what we want every day. God, fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I can at all times have your presence with me. So baptism is a single act. It's a one-time event. But filling is a repeated act. We can always ask to be filled. It's like, a, it's like a free refill fountain. You just go as often as you want and take as much as you want and just get under the fountain and let it even overflow in your cup. That's what the Holy Spirit wants for you and for me, baptism is an unconscious act. You're not even aware of what God did. But being filled is an intentional act. It's something we position ourselves to receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Did you know when you were baptized into that body of Christ? I, I don't know when that happened to me. It happened at salvation. I, I didn't know anything about it. Didn't know there was a body of Christ. <laughs> Most people know so little about it. When the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes, God begins to transact on your behalf and guarantees that more is coming, as we read in Ephesians chapter 1 a few moments ago. And the more that's coming is not only in heaven, but right now being filled afresh with the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. So baptism is for all believers, but filling is for yielded believers. You go out and do whatever you want to do, and you say, I don't feel God. Well, I, he, he doesn't feel you either. <laughs> You've moved away from him. And so filling is when you turn back and make a U-turn and come back and say, okay, I got off track. I did these things that, that I willfully intentionally did. But by the grace of God, you come back and you're filled afresh with the Holy Spirit. Listen, the baptism has no levels. You're baptized or you're not. You're in the body of Christ or you're not. But filling has many levels. And what a blessing it is to be around people who have the Holy Spirit oozing out of them. They're so filled that it becomes contagious. I love being around people like that. Well, one time uh, I listened to a preacher who was actually in Africa explained to me... Uh, it was a missionary, explained to me, uh, uh, to the group that he was talking to, he took a bottle of water out, and he said, this bottle is filled with water. And so if this is you, can you get more Holy Spirit in you? And everybody said, no. 
I, well, I said, well, I said to myself, well, that's an interesting illustration. But you see, you and I are not a bottle with a cap on us. <laughs> we have an open mouth, and we leak all the time. And you're intended by God to bump into people who rub you the wrong way so you have an opportunity to spill a little bit of Holy Spirit. And so if you're a fixed container, that illustration works. But if you're not a fixed container, that illustration doesn't work because it's th that's the baptism picture but not the filling picture. And every single day you and I need a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. I hope you're feeling this as I'm talking about it today, that Holy Spirit right now is filling people, listening, uh, and right here in the room, are you feeling the presence of God washing over you? And so Holy Spirit is our example to follow. This has been very helpful to me to understand. The Bible and the Quran are really clear that Jesus was conceived by the breath of God. And so we can say at no time did Jesus not have the Spirit of God in him. From his very conception, his mother's womb, through his birth and life, the Spirit of God was in Jesus. It is in his DNA. It's in his nature. But at the baptism of Jesus, we discover that Jesus needed not only the Spirit of God at his birth, he needed the Spirit of God for ministry. And so he came to the Jordan River to offer people hope, that their lives can be changed and their sins can be forgiven. And he stepped into the Jordan to be filled with the Spirit of God and with power. And Jesus modeled for us how to be forgiven and how to live with God's Spirit resting upon us. Mark wrote about this in Mark chapter 1 and verse 10. Jesus coming up out of the water saw the heavens open, being torn open, and a spirit descending upon him like a dove. You ever had a bird sit on your shoulder? You need to be conscious of the bird all the time. You're going you're gonna to spook that bird. and he's gonna, I'm not saying you can spook the Holy Spirit, but it's the idea of being conscious of something on your shoulders. And that consciousness is what the Bible speaks about as the spirit being upon you. And so we ask, why does it say upon instead of in? Why does the Bible say that? And this is why it says it. In the day Jesus began his public ministry, he needed the Spirit of God not just in him, but upon him. For everyone he encountered and everyone he touched. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit in you. This is not about whether you have the Holy Spirit or don't. It's whether the Holy Spirit has you. But if you want to do something great for the kingdom of God... You're going to need the Holy Spirit to be upon you. Here's a way we like to say it. Holy Spirit is in you for you, but he's upon you for others. He's in you for presence, for guidance, and for comfort. He is upon you. He is upon me to release power. You ever said, I just feel a powerful moment. You ever feel, I feel an anointing, and then God leads you to do something, to say something to someone so it's not like me to talk to a person like that. No, because the Spirit came upon you, and you began to say things and do things you wouldn't normally do. So it is the anointing that we carry that changes the lives of people whom we encounter. Now, early in his ministry, Jesus taught about Holy Spirit. Whoever believes in me, <laughs> remember these words? As the Scripture says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water, that's why the cap illustration doesn't work, because rivers flow. Rivers cannot be contained. A contained river becomes a stagnant pool. Doesn't do any good for anyone, not even for drinking. And Many churches in the West have become a stagnant pool of what God used to do. When the Holy Spirit fell on the 120 followers of Jesus in the upper room, they went out to tell everyone what had happened to them. You can't have an encounter with the Holy Spirit without affecting your talking. You want to tell people what happened. Peter got up and preached his first spirit-filled sermon, and this is what happened as the people listened. They said this, Now, when they heard Peter, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter, the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. Here was Peter's clear reply. 
Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's a promise from heaven. And then Peter gave some of the best news he could have. He just didn't end there. He wanted to be sure that you and I got that this was not just for those in Jerusalem or those in Ephesus or those in Caesarea or those in Samaria. The promise is for you and for your children, for all who are far off. We're certainly a long way from where all of these events happened right here where we sit today. It is for everyone whom the Lord calls to himself. The Lord wants you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He wants you to have a tongue. He wants you to be able to prophesy. He wants you and me to have the sense of his presence in our life flowing through us in power to help other people as we make our way in life. Well, an invitation is being extended to you today to do these same three things. Receive Jesus as your Savior. That's how you repent You say, my way is not working. I need to do it God's way. And God's way is to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin. The second step is to be baptized. Now, this is water baptism. It's our identifying with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. If you've not ever been baptized in the house, we will give you an opportunity to be baptized. And you're watching online, and you don't know how to be baptized. If you'll write to me, I'll tell you how you can be baptized. And the third step, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit the same way we receive salvation. We ask and we receive. Didn't we say earlier, if God, we know evil, how to give, being evil, know how to give good gifts. How much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to you? So we invite you to thank him for dying for you so you can personally experience the power and love of God's presence in your life. Thank him for giving up his himself as a fragrant offering and sacrifice. Receive Jesus as your Savior. Holy Spirit, come and fill all who are listening to this message with your presence. Give each one a manifestation of your presence in their lives. Just as you receive Jesus as your Savior, receive Holy Spirit right now. Write to me. Tell me about your decision to follow Jesus, and I will send you more information on how to grow as a believer in Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to live within us. Fill us in such a way that we experience your presence. Hear your voice and follow your directions. Fill us to overflowing so that we carry a powerful blessing into the world for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope this message has filled you with living hope in Jesus. If you would like to talk to someone about your spiritual journey, please leave a comment or send us a private message. We enjoy reading your notes and having an opportunity to pray with you. If you received a blessing through this message, please share it with others. We invite you to become a Living Hope Partner by donating as little as a dollar a month through our QR code. Your gifts will help us create new messages and reach more people. Living Hope is a ministry of Ingleside International Incorporated. All donations for Living Hope qualify as a charitable contribution. Thank you for your prayers and support. Next week, we will continue learning together from the Word of God. God bless you and fill you with living hope.